Conservative Book Club members, thank you for joining us today for our exclusive author interview. CBC has over 758,000 members now, and we're proud to have with us a very special author with us today named Rob Long. We have a little background on Rob. Rob is the writer and executive producer of the much-beloved long-running TV series Cheers and the more recently uh, show Kevin Can Wait, and is also the author of Conversations with My Agents and Set Up Joke, Set Up Joke. He's also a contributing editor to National Review, hosts a syndicated radio show, Martini Shot, is a founder of the most wonderful website, ricochet.com, and contributes to many publications, including the Wall Street Journal and the Los Angeles Times. He's a two-time Emmy Award and Golden Globe Award nominee, and he divides his time between New York and Hollywood, and he's even on the board of directors for the American Cinema Foundation. Uh, Rob's put together a, a <laughs> very unique book called Big Lee, Donald Trump in Verse, Make Poetry Great Again. And this is definitely one of our uh, more unique offerings, and we have it up on the website at conservativebookclub.com. And it's already getting some pretty big buzz. Mark Stein says that with this dazzling anthology, bitter fake news hacks for whom Trump is beyond reason will have to admit that he's also beyond rhyme. <laughs> and James Dellingpole, a good columnist over at Breitbart.com, says it best. It's more lyrical than Walt Whitman, pithier than Robert Frost, and making a heck of a lot of more sense than Emily Dickinson. The book should be required reading for every literature major on campus. Rob Long, thank you so much for joining us today. Congratulations on the new book. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Well, Rob, tell us a little bit about your very unique book. What inspired you, and, and why did you write it? Well, um, you know, look, here's the thing. I mean, you love him or you hate him. Donald Trump has a very singular way of expressing himself. He's mastered uh, the short form of the tweet, 140 characters, although they recently doubled that, but... Yeah. 140 characters what he matched, and he knows how to say a lot in a few words, and that is really what poetry is, right? The boiled down essence, a unique way of expressing yourself, uh, and a commitment to form. And that is, uh, that's how Donald Trump speaks, that's how he tweets, that's how he, he writes, if, if, if we could ever see him his writing. That's yeah. how he is. So it felt to me like, um, you know, he was always speaking in a kind of a poetry, we just weren't giving him... Uh, the proper credit. And so my, my goal here was to sort of turn it around and, um, you know, rearrange it, not even not re rearrange it, but just uh, look at his utterances and tweets and interview answers and think, how would this look on the page as poetry? And, you know, it looks pretty good. <laughs> it's definitely unique, and I, I think a, a, definitely an original idea here. This is something that has not been written about Donald Trump yet. Uh, but tell us about your, how did you decide to do it in the, you do a lot of these in high Q format, you do this in lo, uh, as long form as you can on some of this. Tell, tell us about the different topics and different ideas that you, that you use in the book. Well, you know, the, the, for Donald Trump, there really is only one topic, and that's Donald Trump. But he <laughs> occasionally glances into other topics. Um, sometimes it seems almost by mistake. Uh, but it's a kind of a free-form quality to his, uh, the way he thinks and the way he speaks. And so I just read a lot and followed up, uh, uh, called up a lot of interviews. The good news for, for, uh, for fans of a book is that there's, uh, there's enough material in the past almost 40 years of Donald Trump's um, being in the public eye that uh, we could publish one of these once a year, tw maybe twice a year, and never run out of material. But the idea is that you know, he, he, the, the, the topics are almost always the same. It's um, um, America, the wall, his hands, um, the losers uh, in the world, and the winners. And um, once you start to see and read and sort of immerse yourself in all of his work, you get an idea that he really is meditating on a very, very few themes, um, which is part of, you know, I, clearly is part of his political success. And I think also his literary success. You know, I think you make a really good point there. I think a lot of, he gets derided in the media all the time saying he can't complete a sentence, you know, this is worse than George W. Bush, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, a lot of these people fail to realize that even some of the, if you want to call it simple talk that Donald Trump does, obviously that resonated 
with a lot of America. There were a lot of people that appreciated the frankness and appreciated the yeah, sure. uh, the the singular nature of it, so that anybody could understand. I mean. People really, did, it wasn't hard to know what Donald Trump was running on, whether it be building a wall or, you know, dealing with China. Um, but, so, what what are you hoping to accomplish with, with the book each year, other than it being just fun and kind of fun anecdotal, looking back on some of the best of the best that Donald Trump has said? Well, I mean, I look, I have, uh, you know, I've been writing and, and thinking about, um, you know, politics and policy for a long time. And so as a result, I have friends on pretty much all sides. I and mean, I have friends that are would consider themselves part of the progressive left. And I have friends that consider themselves part of the paleo right. And I have friends who are never Trumpers and um, can't stand to see the man on TV um, on both the right and the left. And I have friends who, who love the guy. So um, I, what I was hoping for was a, an a, a kind of a, a, a bridge, a healing volume, you know, that mm -hmm. if, you, if you you think he's a moron and an adult, you can read this book and laugh. And if you think he's, uh, you know, one of the greats to be up on Mount Rushmore, you can read this book and laugh. <laughs> I mean, I don't know anybody who loves Trump who thinks that he's, um, you know, a, 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 a sophisticated orator, as if that's necessary to be the president. Um, and I don't know anybody who hates Trump, who, who, legitimately who hates him or doesn't like him, who won't admit that he's got a very singular, distinctive, and effective way of communicating. So uh, the idea is to sort of find that thing, that common ground we all agree on, and then you know, you know have, a, have a little fun with it. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but if, I, I have a hard time now watching the news. It's just the news is so, it's so furious and so toxic and everybody's so angry. Uh, it doesn't really matter what channel you're watching. There's, there's, there's someone screaming about something on it. Um, uh -huh. And uh, isn't it kind of, I mean, for me, it was part of, part of like, well, can we just have a little bit of fun? I mean, it's, you know, look, it's a slender book. It's not a 500-page tome, but just a little bit of fun to kind of leaven the rage and general political freakouts that people seem to be having every 20 minutes in this country. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about the your Hollywood friends, and I, I am curious to get your thoughts. You've got an amazing career working on every, one of my favorite shows of all time, Cheers, and uh, the new show Kevin Can Wait uh, in its second season. Why, why the response from Hollywood um, in regards to Donald Trump? I, I have never seen, and I'm somebody who follows the Oscars, the Emmys, and Golden Globes, everything right. like that, um, and obviously... You know, the Emmys have been talked about in the last couple, the last two weeks. Why is there so much vitriol and hatred for Donald Trump, especially as he was a guy who, um, I mean, he was for, famous before even the, the Apprentice, but he was one of them at one point. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's what people always forget is that Trump, I mean, his supporters and his detractors forget that Trump was, you know, kind of a socially liberal, progressive guy for a lot of, I mean, well, there's a reason why. Trump finds it easy to make a deal with Ch uh, Chuck Schumer. It's because he's known him for years and he supported him for years. Um, I, I, look, I think the problem with the left and the Hollywood left is sort of the same, which is that they're always going to 11. It's always the apocalypse. Everything's a giant disaster. I mean, uh, Ronald Reagan was the it was the great Satan who was going to destroy the country, and then uh, along came George H. W. Bush, who they sort of tolerated, but they got rid of him fast, and then. George W. Bush was the worst president ever, and the Constitution was being shredded and assaulted. And so, why don't you start at a fever pitch? It's really interesting. That's a very bad show business technique. You know, one of the things we learn in show business is you got to give yourself room to build, right? So you don't, you uh -huh. can't start uh, at eleven. You have to start at six and get your way up to eleven. But since the the, the anger and hatred always has already started at eleven, they have no place to go. It it it, it would be to them. Uh, and to the all progressives, weird to have, be, have a have a a less intense reaction to Donald Trump than they have to George W. Bush. So they have to double down on the hysteria. I mean, because now, or even a less rea less hostile reaction to Donald Trump than they had to Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, now all my, a lot of my progressive friends are telling me how much they love Mitt Romney. Well, you didn't back then. You thought he was a <laughs> You know, dog-hating races to put women in binders. Like it's a very strange world, but it always happens when you when you when you begin uh, every political conversation or every part of your political discourse with screeching outrage. 
um, you got nowhere to go. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I think it's so intense with Donald Trump. And the other reason is because he is one of them in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, look, Trump, uh, and I'm not suggesting that this is necessary to be a successful president or to be an effective president, but Trump has a very, very uh, thin understanding of the, the complexities of world and domestic politics, right? He doesn't really get a lot of the complexity, so you see that now playing out in things like health care and immigration and the DREAM Act and the wall and all those things that seem so simple and so clean and clear um, on the campaign trail now seem a little more complicated and not so easy. Uh, and that's that's normal. That's what all presidents go through. But uh, but he sounds like if you if you simply on the campaign trail flipped his bias and you could ima- close your eyes and imagine a left wing bombastic, very articulate but uh, left wing um, candidate, it would be somebody who yeah a lot of the progressives that we all know. Uh, and so I think that, I mean, this is now engaging a little bit of Freudian analysis. The thing that you hate the most in, you know, in Freudian terms is kind of the thing you fear you resemble the most. Mm. So when they see Donald Trump and they hear stories about how he treats women or they hear stories about how he doesn't really want to read the briefing paper or, you know, they think he'd really rather go play golf and hang out, um, that's. That's who they are. That's how they feel. That's the, their deep down shadow self. So of course they hate it because Trump is doing it and doing it without without embarrassment or apology. And I would, as bad as Trump may have treated the women in his uh, orbit, and it does seem like he treated them poorly, I, I would find it hard to believe any uh, many Hollywood stars would uh, come out better um, in that kind of scrutiny. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio would, uh, although I don't know. I, <laughs> I, so, so the thing, but usually the thing you hate is the thing that reminds you of yourself. So Interesting. that's what I would say. And the, the, the armchair psychology, I'm not licensed to practice it in the state of New York, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> well, one last question, Rob. You know, a lot... We here at the Conservative Book Club, we appreciate the arts. We love books. We love movies, TV, and music. And But constantly, it just feels like we're being assaulted and insulted by Hollywood and just the liberal propaganda. I guess I, I, you're someone who's doing good work. And I, I would is, do you have any suggestions for people on how they could be promoting uh, work? And, and I don't know if it's voting by your remote control or... Um, or what? What are what are things that conservatives could do to make their voices heard more, um, or have the topics that they care about resonate in Hollywood and New York? Well, it's really, really, really out way to the programming and the entertainment that you want. Um, but right now, I mean, it, it, it really is a question. It really is a, a, a much smaller problem. Um, although it may, may feel more intense, it really isn't. We, there are 10, 15 channels of, of no, there are 40 right now, uh, channels um, of, with original scripted programming. Um, 10 or 15 of them um, are kind of not political, but maybe soap opera or history. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of great stuff on. I mean, if anyone uh, wants to see a great, show about America's founding watched on AMC the show turns fantastic oh yeah um, if you are if you're a conservative um, and you believe in you know first principle first conservative principles if you're watching the Walking Dead um, I mean I don't know it seems silly but the Walking Dead you know they're they're trying to reconstruct a nation uh, or a society and they're discovering that the best way to do that is through very conservative almost libertarian principles. Um, I mean, I don't know whether the, 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 the guys writing that show were aware of that, but that's that's, that's what they're doing. Um, so there's plenty on there. You might have to hunt and gather a little bit more than you did in the past, but that's so every, that's kind of the new media landscape. And the second thing I'd say is um, if you're a young person or if you're an old, rich person, um, you should be making your own. Um, there's, there are plenty of places to put up great entertainment. There are plenty of channels that will run it. Um, 
there are plenty of opportunities now, especially for young people, to really what is in the culture stream. And, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't. I mean, just if I could get on my soapbox for one minute, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in the right, and I understand why we do it, having fun uh, uh, kicking out the liberals and triggering all of the snowflake progressives. And I, and I get it. That's fun and funny, and it's hilarious to see them do it, and it's almost it's addictive. But we're not, we, we need to spend more time building our own and building our own stuff. So that rather than protesting what's on SNL or whatever, and rather than uh, trying just to just for shock value entertainment, we should be building and making our own stories, making our own movies, making our own TV shows, making our own TV channels. I mean, there's a huge amount of wealth in this country that believes in free market, center-right principles, and um, we just need to get that message across. So... It's never, it's never been a better time for us to seize the opportunity, as we do. Well, it's, it's wonderful, Robin. That, you know, something we always preach about, too, and trying to support people that want to get, that have like a center right uh, political leaning and get it, their MFAs and their, uh, you know, screenwriting yeah. credits and, and all that, we, and, and try to find vehicles in which that would help harness those voices. And I know there's some that exist out there and a lot of foundations and others, but, um, Rob, we appreciate the good work that you're doing. I, I love Bigly. I, I laughed uncontrollably with some of <laughs> with some of this. <laughs> and I, I, you know, we definitely recommend it to all conservative book club members. It's called Bigly, Donald Trump in Verse, uh, Helping Make Poetry Great Again by Rob Long. And you can check it out on conservativebookclub.com and also learn a little bit more about Rob. Rob, thank you again so much and congratulations on the book. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks again.